I was prepared for all the things that he's done, uh, which is like uh, flying on the helicopter, the first the first helicopter to fly around in the world. But I wasn't prepared for this, and which was re interesting because uh, I didn't even know he got the Distinguished Flying Cross uh, in Vietnam. And on that mission, he actually it was right before him and his group was supposed to leave Vietnam, like the day before. Uh, just getting the story, the way that he told it, uh, was pretty amazing. Chief Master Sergeant Don A. Beasley, the sheer fact of uh, service for, for self, he's lived that his entire life. Working some of the NASA missions and then actually going through some of the interviews, Chief Beasley has probably impacted every pararescue person that is trained today. The pararescue training when he went through, there's only maybe one or two people that actually even went through the pararescue training. He's also led some of those training facilities. You can almost say he's one of the pioneers for pararescue, for modern day pararescue that we have today. My dad was a former New York City paramedic or would train the pararescue guys that were supporting. And so after talking through some of that stuff uh, with my dad and talking through with Chief Beasley, uh, it kind of struck a nerve of, uh, you know, as far as rescue is concerned and making sure that we have our search and rescues in place. His biggest takeaway was the te technology comes and goes, but leadership doesn't. And what you need to sit down and realize is you're going to be that person to make uh, that young enlisted folk believe in themselves, right? And so you give them a sense of purpose and they'll actually go do and you'll be surprised by it. And so that uh, was one of the big takeaways that I took as far as the leader is concerned, uh, along with uh, just the perseverance and the way that he, in, he ensured that his entire crew was, was good to go on every mission. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Major Jeffrey Ledoux, and I have, my, I have the distinct honor and privilege to introduce Chief Master Sergeant Don A. Beasley. Chief Beasley started out his service in 1956 as a Russian linguist, but in 1963, he decided he wanted to change. He traded his listening station for a perfectly good helicopter airplane that he could jump out of just for fun. Oh, and occasionally he decided he wanted to rescue people here and there. He decided to become a pararescue jumper. He had countless impacts on the US space programs, starting with the Apollo mission, where he would help design and implement the capsule rescue apparatus and help stabilize the craft and facilitate the extraction of astronauts after a splashdown. Additionally, as a lead pararescue member, he supported the first helicopter flight around the world by providing rescue capability for the entire crew. His, his drive to better the pararescue career field is evident with procedures he helped develop over the course of his 31-year career that are still in use today. He is a leader's leader who is willing to put himself on the line to support his fellow team members and his comrades. Many people still look up to Don, both literally and figuratively, for his safe advice or where to find a quick fosters. He continues to support service members by working with both the Disabled American Veterans Organization and the Veteran Affairs. Chief Mass Sergeant Beasley's wisdom and innovative methods have had a lasting impact on the armed services. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Gathering of Eagles stage Chief Beasley being interviewed by our Gathering of Eagles team member, Major Joe Dolce. <laughs> It's okay, Chief. It's okay. We're not gonna, we're not gonna Before you're gonna ask me today, I just want to you see a guy up here six foot seven, three hundred pounds, uh, went through Ranger School where we went through old Kapanoki swamps. We had a little camp, we had a little uh, little Linzetti compass and a map and a knife. Never scared me. Sitting up here just scaring the hell out of me. <laughs> well, Chief. You've been in a lot of scary situations, but I'm not that scary, so it'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. Chief B. Lee, it's an honor to have you here to tell your stories. Uh, first off, I want you to talk about your family and how uh, your family life uh, impacted you during your 31 years of career and then after. 
So uh, if you can give me some insights on, on those pieces. Well, if you didn't have the support of the family, you wouldn't be able to do what we did. Uh, when I came into the Air Force, I came in specifically, I wanted to come in and become a uh, airborne radio operator. And I got in and all of a sudden they wanted me to be a radio traffic analyst and a crypto analyst, uh, Russian uh, crypto analyst. So I did that for four years. And uh, then I came back and they sent me to another school and I did that. Uh, and in 63, I was at Scott Air Force Base and I was looking around to see what was going on. And I, you know, my family life at that time had not started, but I was going with this young lady at, at Scott. And the, the pararescue career field was open uh, because all we had at that time was cross trainees. Uh, the, the career field opened up and they were trying to get people to go to scuba school and jump school. Uh, and the old pararescue guys had all been uh, cross trained out uh, after the, uh, the Korean War and were too old to go through. They had an age limit, I think 90 years old, but they had an age limit for going through scuba school and jump school. And so most of those guys were not eligible, so they were trying to get new people into it to go out and see what they could do. So I uh, ended up uh, wanting to go into pararescue because I, I, I saw a light on the, at the end of the tunnel that that's what I really thought was something unique. And, uh, and it wasn't a lie because it was unique. So I came in and I and ended up uh, with this young lady and we decided we were gonna get married but I was going to go to jump school. And she goes, uh, we need to get married before you go because when am I gonna see you again? And I said, yeah, we'd probably get married, so we did. And uh, we started out, uh, I, th at that time you'd go to one school, you'd come back to the base, you'd go to another school. It's like today, TDY to, the, to Afghanistan or out to the desert. Uh, every six months you're out and you come back. Uh, so we, I went through all the schools and it took just about a year to complete all the schools. And in the meanwhile, we had a little child, a little girl. Uh, that was my first one, uh, Lisa. and. Uh, and at that time, we ended up going down to the transition school at, uh, at uh, Eglin Air Force Base. And they were just starting the transition school up. We had three instructors down there. And I'd started out with 15 individuals. And we would go, five of us go at one school, five of us go at another school. And it would be different schools uh, until we met up at, supposedly end up at the transition school. When I got there, I walked in and I'm the only student. Uh, the other 14 had washed out. And that's not good news when you're a student and you're in that kind of, got those kind of instructors that are looking at you that, uh, uh, we got one here. Uh, it was push-ups and it was running and it was making, doing all the, the, the little things you do. And it had an active duty team there. And the active duty team had a couple of young, uh, young pararescue men that had come back from, from uh, Saudi Arabia, not Saudi, uh, Ethiopia. And they'd come back and they would, uh, we hit it off and they thought I was a nice guy. So they'd come over to the house every night about 10 o'clock with a case of beer, want to play cards, and then we'd sit there till three o'clock and I'd get up at five o'clock and go run my three miles and do my PT. And then I'd walk back up there and they're leaning up against the building going, well, Roy, what do you think? We ought to go back and take a nap? That was a rough night last night. So I said, oh no, this ain't gonna work, Pat. But uh, got through all of that uh, and ended up getting an assignment to uh, Hickam Air Force Base and uh, as a pararescueman. And when I got there, uh, we ended up having our second child. Uh, the first child was born at Scott Air Force Base and the second one was born, and she's here today, uh, in Hawaii, a little Hawaiian girl. And uh, we spent that, uh, the years that I spent there were unbelievable. That's when uh, we were doing the Apollo and the Gemini and uh, those kind of programs. And I ended up uh, going to Vietnam from there. And I came back and went to uh, Bermuda Another bad assignment, you know. It, we pararescue had some bad assignments, you know. Hawaii, Bermuda, Alaska, uh, you know, all the all the the dungeons that you don't want to go to. Uh, but uh, we went back when I, when we got to Bermuda, uh, we closed Bermuda down. Went back to uh, McCoy Air Force Base. McCoy closed down, and I went back to Hawaii, and then I had my son. So we've got my I, three three children. Uh, they're all doing very well. I uh, my uh, my ex-wife, she divorced us because, uh, again, that the life of a pararescue man uh, in that family, uh, like a lot of you know, there's uh, when you're in combat and et cetera, it gets a little bit harsh. Uh, so we ended up uh, getting a divorce. Very amenable. We uh, get along fine. My kids are, are there. And then I uh, 
remarried. We, I met a girl over in England when I was stationed in England, uh, a young Air Force young lady. Uh, and we got married and been married 40 years now and uh, been happy ever since. That was a great story, Chief. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I know uh, it, was, it was his wife's birthday two days ago, so happy birthday, Mitzi. Huh. Um, oh, yeah, nobody got her cards. She's a <laughs> southern girl, and, and ever since she got here, her birthday was Monday, and we got here Monday, and she was telling everybody, it's my birthday, it's my birthday. So th every time we went someplace, we, everybody would say, it's your birthday, isn't it? Yeah, so she doesn't, she doesn't, she's not too bl uh, bashful. She'll tell you in a heartbeat. She's from Cotton Valley, Louisiana. Anybody ever heard of Cotton Valley? They don't have any cotton, but... So, uh, Chief, now we'll get to the storytelling piece. Um, you had a great opportunity in your career to support the first helicopter flight around the world. Uh, just please talk to your experience. One, how did you get picked up to go fly with Mr. Uh, H. Ross Perot in 1982? And then talk through how that experience worked and to support that flight. Well, it's H. Ross Perot Jr. Uh, I was sitting up in Alaska. I had a team up there, and I was sitting up there, and. Uh, I get a call from 23rd Air Force, which at that time was ASOC, which was our the control of all the rescue people and the combat controllers, but it was uh, the beginning of ASOC was the 23rd Air Force. And they called me up and uh, said, hey, Don, we need to get you uh, to go on a, on a mission. Uh, we need to get you one more guy. We need to have a PJ team on board with all your equipment and all the equipment you're going to need uh, to jump uh, into the North Atlantic or the North Pacific. And, uh, and rescue a group that might crash in on there in the helicopter. And I'm going, uh, you're speaking Greek. What, what are we talking about here? And they go, well, there's a gentleman named H. Ross Perot, and he's got a son that wants to fly around the world. And uh, it was the first part of September. Uh, he had uh, been uh, of 82, and they were, he was sitting there reading the paper, and there was a young man from Australia coming in, and the, he was going to fly around the world in a Bell helicopter and was picking it up there in Dallas and was going to pick it up and fly around the world. And so he called his son, Junior, and said, hey, uh, how would you feel about that? And he goes, I think an American ought to, we ought to be able to do that. It shouldn't be anybody else coming and doing it. The Americans ought to be doing that. So his son agreed, and so they decided they would get themselves a Bell helicopter. So on a Friday, they ordered it. And on the next Friday, or Friday morning, they ordered a Bell, and they paid $725,000 for it. And uh, it was delivered that afternoon. Then they sent it over, and 18 days later, they got it modified for extra tanks, uh, extra radar, I mean, extra uh, uh, navigational aids on it. Uh, they, they were ended up getting about 375 miles uh, distance on them, uh, extended the, the, the fuel, uh, fuel on it. So we, I said, okay, we'll go down and we'll see what's happening. So we got all of our equipment on board a, a civilian aircraft. Uh, we flew. Uh, down to Dallas, we got to Dallas. I'd never even heard of H. Ross Perot, had no earthly idea who he was. And uh, when we got to the airport there, we had the whole line of all of our equipment with you know, scuba tanks, parachutes, uh, medical kits, uh, the, the life rafts, uh, support system that we'd have to have if they went into the water, uh, what we'd get them out of. His dad is very, very protective, obviously. So. Then we ended up going over to, they, when we got there, there were three guys standing there, and they're going, uh, where's Chief Beasley, where's Chief Beasley? And, and we were in civilian clothes, and so they said, well, we got our trucks outside there, and they're, they had control of anything you wanted to do. H. Ross could do anything you wanted to do, because they had the pickup truck sitting right up there next to where we unloaded everything, and they just took everything we got, put it in the trucks, and says, we got in a limousine, and we went out to what they called EDS, which was, uh, I think it was electronic, I can't even remember what it was. But that's what H. Ross owned. He was the big boy on that. We drove out there, and it's on a nine-hole golf course. And as you get up to the gate, there's two guys standing there, and they've got crew cuts, and they've got blue uniforms on, and they've got 45s on their hips. And I'm going, where are we at here? You know, what's going on here? Uh, but that was H. Ross. He, that was his business up there. So we went in, and we, we were introduced to him, and he took us into the wardroom, and in the wardroom, they had a flight plan that they were going to go all the way around the world with it. Uh, there was a young man named Jay Colburn uh, who had been in Vietnam, uh, which was a Huey, uh, Huey pilot, and he was going to be the co-pilot. He had been working for H. Ross all this time as, as his pilot. 
And uh, H. Ross Jr. had just finished Vanderbilt, uh, graduated, and his dad hadn't given him his graduation present yet, so that was his present to be able to go to, to chopper school and to learn how to fly a helicopter. And we got started briefing them on survival and how to do it if we went into the water, what they were going to have to do when we went in the water uh, for us to be able to, to get to them. So uh, we would get uh, that afternoon, we went down and we had, we had lunch. And as we got through with lunch, you went through lunch a cafeteria style. Now here's the, one of the world's richest men, and we go through cafeteria style with little metal plates like you had in the military. And at the end of the meal, you're sitting there and you scrape your stuff off in a can and you put it on the thing and you move on and he's in front of us doing the same thing and you're going, holy, crying out loud, you know, this is gonna be something else. So uh, the next day we ended up uh, doing some briefing and, and H. Ross would come in one morning and he'd have a, he'd have a, uh, a scuba mask and he'd say, uh, diver mask, and he'd say, would, would this work on them? And we said, yeah, but we, we've got that equipment for them. Don't, don't worry about it, they won't be needing it. Oh, I thought maybe I'd buy a couple of these and let, let them have them. And he'd come in every day with something else that he was, he was worried sick on, on that something was going to happen to his son. So uh, after many briefings and we told him how we were going to do everything, we'd be okay. It wasn't going to be a big problem. We uh, ended up going over to Love Field and uh, the, the day that we were going to take off, uh, 1 September. And we were waiting for a 1.30 to come in and all of a sudden this weird looking 130 comes flying in and taxis up to us and the crew gets off and uh, you didn't know who they were. Uh, they all worked for CIA. They were the uh, Air America boys and uh, they had hired that aircraft to, uh, they'd just come in from, from Africa as a matter of fact, landed that day back from Africa and uh, they were cleaning stuff out of it and they were getting ready to load stuff on and we got introduced to the loadmaster and the loadmaster was sitting there and he was from Scotland and uh, thank God I'd been to, to England and could understand maybe every other word that he said. Uh, and he was uh, very adamant about how he was going to pick us up and get us back in the aircraft where we had to hang up if we did a jump. And about that time, a three-star general walked up to the back and he said, we're, we're in flight suits at this time. And uh, he walks up to the back of the aircraft and he said, Chief, uh, how, uh, how are you going to jump this thing? I don't see any, any kind of uh, uh, apparatus here for, you know, the stand up, hook up, and, and no, uh, no cable, jump cables. And we said, well, we'll hook up to a D-ring on the, on the floor. They're, you know, they're, they're 5,000 pound tensile, so we don't have to worry about that. And uh, he said, well, how are they gonna get you back in? The, the big thing all that time was, once you had a hang up or you jumped and you had a hang up, you'd end up you know, having to get back into, or they'd try to retrieve you into the aircraft unless you put your hand on your head and they'd cut you loose and you'd get your reserve out. And I said, but uh, he's got that all planned down. He's got a system up in the front up there. And he said, well, let me talk to him a minute. And I said, ooh. So I walk up to the front of the aircraft and I said, I want you to talk to this general back there and tell him that you're gonna t hook us up uh, into the line from, the, from your hoist up here in the back, your winch rather, and come back and you're gonna hook around it and you're gonna be able to bring us back in on the static line and bring us in. And I said, but put on your biggest brogue and he won't understand a word you said. And he said, oh, you might. And he went back there, and after about 15 minutes of talking with the general, the general was just sitting back there going, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, he said, Chief, come here. And I come over there, and he said, he said, you know the old adage, foo some people, and et cetera. And I said, yes, sir. And he said, do it safe, son, do it safe. I said, I think we will. I think we'll be able to do this right. So we took off, and uh, we, we ended up going to 26 countries. And uh, we ended up in, in, uh, in, in, up in uh, Greenland. As we were landing in Greenland, they were having a bunch of problems up there uh, of, of getting us into another little base on the other side of England, uh, I mean on, on Greenland, to get fuel. And the airplane operator up there, or the airport operator, was not gonna let us come in. He said, no, we're not gonna be able to let you come in and get fuel. And so uh, the, the people in power there at, at uh, Greenland said, uh, go ahead, uh, he's on vacation, so you probably be able to get in. We flew over there and we got there and, and landed. And uh, when we landed, this lady came out, they gave us the fuel and everything. Uh, the, the, the banker that we called on the aircraft, because we had 11, uh, on that 130, we had 11 uh, extra people uh, that was all support of the helicopter. And he had already given the money and everything to H. Ross Jr. So when they landed there, they paid for it and they also gave her a ticket uh, you know, to fly any place she wanted to go on American Airlines, first class, da da da. You know, probably worth about a thousand dollars. 
Because when we took off on the 130, we had a guy we called the banker. And there had to have been about a million dollars in a satchel that he had because he was going to be buying our way through all these countries that we were going through. And uh, when we landed uh, at, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Canada before we got there, uh, we had landed and there was no quarters available for us because they had all the caribou hunters in. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, the, the banker walked in, talked to a bunch of people, and about 15 minutes later, here was all these hunters coming out and they're getting on aircraft and they're going out, they're going hunting that day and gonna stay out there that day if we got all their rooms. And I don't know what that cost them because there was a, a lot of money going out. Uh, after we left, uh, the little, after we were take off from this little place uh, on the other side of uh, Greenland, uh, we were heading for the Shetland Islands. We were going to RO in Shetland. And as we took off, uh, there was a truck coming down the road, about 99 miles an hour, the gravel road, kicking up smoke and all. And the pilot, uh, he's one of the, he's sitting there the whole time he's in a 130. He's got that cigarette hanging out of his mouth, and he's got his foot cocked up, and he's a hell of a pilot. But he was just one of those old, the, the old Air America guys that, uh, you know, they did what they wanted to do and how they wanted to do it. And uh, We'd sit there and say, you know, you, you're smoking on the aircraft and da 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 da, and you go, oh, no, no big deal. That's like can't, can't burn anyway, you know. But all of a sudden, this guy came down on the, uh, after he got there. The helicopter had already taken off and it just barely got off the run. They had a drop off and it was just enough to where they get enough speed to where they dropped off and they got the speed up. And he came back around and the, the truck is coming across the flight line, and he comes down to about maybe 10 feet above that truck, and comes down and burns them, just throwing up. Uh, gravel and everything from the blades coming up and everything and took off and sprayed out, uh, sprayed out. and uh, you could hear the, the, this guy come back onto the, ba onto the base, got on his phone up there and he was calling us and a lot of few choice words went back and forth. And, uh, but it was, uh, uh, the next night was in Shetland Islands and if you ever read the story uh, that H. Ross put out, uh, there was three uh, individuals that got downstairs with the local boys and uh, were drinking beer at this thing and we had an arm wrestling contest. And uh, he keeps saying that was the, the only time he ever witnessed, a, this is Ross Jr. that witnessed an arm wrestling champion was a six foot seven guy. And uh, we uh, destroyed the, the Shetland boys, uh, every one of us that had our little battles with them with their arm wrestling. Uh, the next night we flew into uh, England, myself and uh, Corey Petty, or Irv Petty, who was my co-partner on this thing. Uh, we flew back to, well, we flew in, when we got into England, we flew uh, back to Alaska and uh, after we'd stayed a couple of days in England and we waited there because the aircraft left there and went all the way around in a bunch of uh, more countries, 26 countries altogether. When they got into Afghanistan and in Pakistan, they threw their maps away because they couldn't get permission to land and they went ahead and landed anyway, but they threw their maps away and said they were lost. So that, and then some more money came out, but, uh, but they were lost and they, uh, because the embassies were not letting them do that. And then we, I sent another, I didn't go back on the second route because I thought somebody else needed to get that experience with those guys. And so a guy by the name of Brad Voss, which was another one of my little staff sergeants, he went out with uh, Irv Petty and they met up with him in Singapore. And then they flew from Singapore all the way around. When they got to the end of, uh, up at Hokkaido and up by Masawa, uh, they couldn't get permission to go into Russia. Uh, Russia wasn't going to give them any permission to come down that Kamchatka Peninsula for anything. They were just going to, uh, so they were sitting there sort of stymied on what was going on. But in the meanwhile, in the background, H. Ross was talking with a bunch of people and he had some friends that, with the president, the freighter company, and there was a President McKinley was in that area as a, as a uh, container ship and it went off course uh, and it, uh, went off course to get to a position where they'd be able to get enough fuel from them to fly on to Shimya. And uh, when we met up with them, we flew out of Hawaii, I mean, back out of Alaska and came back around and we uh, watched them come in on that container ship and they dropped there and they had a little damage on the aircraft, on the helicopter when they did it because they had 40 foot seas and they had some winds and we're going, oh boy, this is a good one. Uh, and they did, they, they did an outstanding landing and refueled. And once they refueled and got, uh, got going, there was, uh, uh, we start out and we were, st we were sitting in behind them and uh, we were getting up to probably Atu, and, uh, and our navigator was going, you know, they haven't got much fuel left. Uh, we've been hitting some headwinds, and, uh, and we're, we're 
wondering if they're going to be able to make it in there. And they were talking to the to the chopper, and, and Colburn said, kept saying, Jay kept saying, I think we can make it. I think we can make it. So we dressed up in the back. We put our gear on, and we were ready to go because we thought they were going to ditch in between Atu and, and Shimia. And uh, we had the door open, and we were sitting there just waiting for them to go in, and we'd be right on top of them, and that wouldn't be any problem. Well, they made it into Shimia. And as soon as they got touched down in Shimia and taxied off, they had a flame out. So they just barely got in there. And then the rest of it was just, they just flew into Anchorage and they flew down in 29 days and eight hours, I think it was, uh, 100 or 26,000 miles, uh, they landed under 30 days, they did the, the flight around the world. Uh, about six months later, not even six months, I guess it was about four months later, we get a call and they want us to show up at Washington, D.C. And so the three of us with our spouses went to Washington, D.C. and uh, at the, and we, we're all sitting in this, uh, you know, regular blue jeans and shirts, and we get off the plane, and a guy's sitting there, and he said, I'm supposed to take it to this for Mr. Ross's thing, and I said, okay. So we pull up this place, and there's no, there's no address, there's not, no big flashy signs or anything, but it had to be some sort of a hotel or a, but we pulled up there, and when we got there, we walked inside, and there's somebody over there playing the harp, and there's people walking around with, and we're walking in with this stuff, and they're all dressed up, and and all of a sudden, the, the clerk on the side over there said, you must be Chief Beasley. And I said, yeah. And they said, you're the only one walked through there at 6, 7. And I said, well, that probably would be a kick. So we ended up going to the Smithsonian. And uh, they dedicated the, the uh, Spirit of Texas to the Smithsonian Institute. And while we were there, uh, it was uh, uh, Beachy was the chief of staff of the, the chairman of the chief of staff of the Army, or the, or the Joint Chief of Staff. And he's probably about uh, five foot two. And he came over and talked to me. He said, uh, Chief, he said, uh, what do you think about them being able to fly this thing around the world? And I said, well, it was, it was a pretty good trip. And he said, yeah, but he said, God dig it. He said, you know, I think that the, I think that the, uh, uh, that the Army or the military should have done that. He said, I don't think any civilian group ought to do that. We got helicopters. Why haven't we done something like that? And uh, I said, sir, I have no idea that uh, we, uh, he sat there for 20 minutes berating why the Army and the Navy and the Air Force did not do that, and the civilian world did it. And, but they dedicated that aircraft. We were sitting underneath the Spirit of Texas and underneath the Spirit of St. Louis and uh, in white gloves, and they're giving us the, the big sit-down white-collar dinner. And they ended up dedicating that uh, helicopter to it, and it's been there ever since. That was a, that was a great story, Chief. Um, and, and like I said, flying around in, in the helicopter probably was a, a great experience, or not the helicopter, but the support aircraft behind it. Um, can you get to some of your stories that you have from Vietnam and some of those exciting rescues that you had in Vietnam uh, and tell, tell the folks what kind of experiences you saw there? Vietnam was, uh, uh, was our war for the, for the rescue people. That's where we first started uh, really becoming a, a name and becoming a, an association of uh, pararescue. Uh, we, we went over there and uh, we, we'd all been trained for, like I was in Hawaii and we were doing the Apollo and the Gemini missions, we were doing all that, and then all of a sudden Vietnam broke loose and we, uh, now they needed PJs over there, but none of us, we had no idea what, you know, guns on the helicopter, we had none of that stuff, none of that was even thought of. Well, they brought us all back to uh, Eglin and they put the M60s on the, uh, on the uh, three E's and we were over there and we learned the, the 360s and we learned to run the penetrator. Uh, in Hawaii, all we had was 130s. We hadn't even, nobody was really working with the 53s or the, I mean the threes or the 53s were brand new. They hadn't been really taken into uh, consideration yet. And so uh, our training for the whole time for us to go to Vietnam was go learn how to fly in the M60 and to be able to operate that penetrator and drop it into a 55 gallon barrel uh, where the survivor was going to be, if the engineer or somebody got hurt, we could operate that, that hoist. So we had no background when we got over there. But once we got over there, uh, the, uh, the missions were just, they were breaking left and right. Uh, we ended up coming out of there as the most decorated unit in, in Southeast Asia. And the, and the only reason for that is we were, they were telling the pilots if they got shot down, we were going to get them, which we did. If you look at the number of pilots that were shot down, or the number of aircraft that were shot down, and the number of POWs that they got, uh, it's, I don't know what that ratio is, but it's very low, because we, if they got down, if they went down, we'd get them. 
and we spent days getting them out sometimes and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of damage to the rescue uh, crews and the aircraft and and loss of people but we got the pilot out and uh, we we didn't stop until we got them uh, unless they got captured if they got captured before we got them we knew that so then we the, the, the SAR was called off uh, one of the best ones was when uh, we had little A1Es were what we called the uh, uh, Sandys. Uh, four of them would take off with two helicopters, and that was the rescue force. And then you had a 130 up on top, which was the uh, was Crown, or at, at one time it was Crown, and then another time it was King. And uh, they were the they were the uh, control. And when somebody went down, they contacted Crown, and Crown would scramble the jollies, and we'd go off. And we had a couple of jollies up in uh, up in Laos that we'd sit on the ground up there waiting for something to happen up in the northern part of uh, North Vietnam, and we had them at uh, NKP and at Udon. So uh, all of a sudden we get a big battle going on over in uh, at Magia Pass, and Magia Pass was notorious. That's a no-no zone. That's where the Ho Chi Minh came through, and we lost a lot of aircraft around that place. So. Uh, we ended up going uh, up to pick up this FAC driver. He got shot down up there. So we get up there, and uh, and we made about three passes in to try to get him, and we just got hosed. And I was on low bird, and we, we when we went in on the mission, you had a high bird and a low bird. The low bird would go in, a high bird would sit up here. We'd punch tanks on the low bird to go in and do the pickup, and the high bird would stay up here and protect us or be ready to come in and get us if we went down too, which that happened a lot. Uh, but the A1Es were all circling, and they would do a daisy chain around us, and you got any ground fire, they would zoom in on the ground fire and just trail it out and, and try to eliminate it. Um, this particular time, we were not being able to get this guy, and all of a sudden, uh, a Sandy got hit. And uh, this, uh, I can't remember his name, I th uh, he was a lieutenant colonel, and he ended up uh, being awarded the Medal of Honor because uh, they hit his Sandy, and the bullet had gone up and burnt his parachute, to where he couldn't eject from it, so he had to fly this damaged uh, A1E back to Udorn. And they escorted him back, and it was a, 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 a really, really a, a harrowing little ride that he had to have, but he ended up getting the Medal of Honor. Uh, but the, uh, as, as the story kept going on, we were sitting up there, and, and we kept going back in, and they said, okay, it's clear now, we'd go back in, and they'd hose us down, and we'd come back up. And uh, he was starting to get a little gun shy. And then all of a sudden they said, uh, Hey, Jolly, back off. We got the supers coming in. We got the buffs coming in. And that's the first time we'd seen the buffs. We knew they were there. We knew the 53s. We knew who the pilots were. We knew the PJs. They were all at Udorn. But they were in a transition period with that minigun and everything. So we were not really uh, involved with them. We had our mission. Uh, they had not been on a mission yet. They had been there for about five months and had not done a mission yet. We were, we were still the, the, the primary. All of a sudden they came in and after we'd been down there all that time and, and with them M60s and firing back and, and trying to get something done, all of a sudden this aircraft come out of nowhere and it's got flames shooting out two sides and out the ass end of it and that's that minigun. And it became a, a lumber company. The trees were just going down on both sides and we're sitting there going, holy, crying out loud. And they come into a hover, stopped, here comes the PJ, come, I mean the, the pilot come running over to the aircraft, got on the penetrator, brought him up and come up and and then the big mouth on the jolly, big jolly says, what was so bad about that? And it's, uh, try to get an M60 against a minigun and you'll, <laughs> you know what, you know who's gonna win that battle. Uh, we lost what, we lost a, a PJ, we had a, oh, we didn't lose him. Uh, we had another mission, we were high, and this was just before I left Vietnam. Uh, well, there was two missions. Uh, this one was, uh, we, had got, we had lost a, a, a Sandy pilot and had got shot down, but he, at, that, at, at night they, flew as SPADs. Uh, they had two missions in the daytime or whenever we had a SAR mission, they'd fly with us as the SAR. And in the daytime, uh, at nighttime, they would go as PAD or there was a couple other call signs they used doing different different missions. Uh, he'd gotten shot down, so we went um, we went in to get him. And uh, myself and a guy by the name of Ember Curry uh, were on low bird. And uh, we went in to get him and uh, all of a sudden we hear uh, the high bird coming back. He said, you better break right, you got a 37 coming up your rump. Because what they would do is, as you would fly into something, they, the 37s would track you from the rear, and they'd come right up to your ramp. And that's how they blew most of the helicopters out of the ground, was that they'd come up your ramp. So uh, we broke left, and, and we flew around a little bit, and about that time, one of the other Sandys went in to do something, and he got blown out. And he blew up in the, in the air. There was nothing left of his aircraft. A 37 got him. 
So all of a sudden, here comes the uh, 53s again, and they came back in, and then the lumber company went to work, and uh, they took care of all the opposition, and they picked him up. And as they picked him up and came back, there was one ZPU, or another 37 rather, sitting on top of a hill that nobody knew of, all of a sudden tracked in on their rear end, and it went in on the aircraft, and uh, the PJ in the back of it there was blown all the way up to the front. And so all of a sudden, they're, they're, they're going to have to leave the aircraft. The aircraft is damaged, so we're, we're finding a safe place for them to land. Uh, we got the la safety land for them. Uh, we pulled up alongside of them. We jumped out. Uh, we, we had some gomers running around on the outside of us out there. We didn't know who they were, but we fired at them anyway. Uh, and we got uh, Pope off. Pope was the, was the PJ that was on that thing, and he had his leg. Uh, uh, it was just hanging there on nothing. So we had a tourniquet around there. His partner had already put the tourniquet around him. We drug him over to, our, to the other aircraft, the 53 line at the same time. And we flew back to NKP, and we got to NKP, and I jumped out of our aircraft and ran over. And the, and the feelings you have when you have your partner on the aircraft, when, you're, when your team is on the aircraft, uh, that's your man. Nobody touches your man. That's, uh, you, you sort of feel a possession. Now, here's a wounded one, and I come up to the door, and I, and I, and I grab the, the end of the, uh, the litter, and all of a sudden, there's an M60 sitting right in the middle of my head, and it's a PJ. And he said, don't touch him, B. That's my man. And I said, we got it. We got it. I backed away, and they got uh, the other. There was two PJs on board besides Pope. They brought him out and everything. And, and the, the guy, the, the other PJ, had reached around in front of him and said, back out. So said, back out. But that's the first time I ever had an M16 stuck in my head, and I thought that that trigger was moving. But... Uh, we got him out, and uh, he's, he was a poster child for a while because they had a picture of him in front of a 53 on crutches with that leg gone, giving him the high sign. And uh, we use that a lot for, that's, that was what we do. Uh, on the DFC thing, uh, we'd gone in for a Carter 02, uh, had landed in a big hot bivouac area. Uh, we had trolled through there uh, once, twice, and when we came through the third time, uh, we knew the Gomers were in there. Uh, but we didn't know where he was at, and finally he popped the smoke, and one of the Sandys found the smoke, and it was right on the far end of that bivouac area. So we came back around to come in on it, and we hadn't fired a shot the whole time going through there because nobody was showing themselves. When we came through that last time, they were in the caves, they were coming out of the caves, they were everywhere, and we were just hosing everything down, coming back and forth. And that's with the M60. If you had the minigun, there wouldn't have been any competition, but with that M60, uh, they were firing back at us as fast as we were firing at them. And uh, we went in, and all of a sudden they said, he wants a PJ on the ground because he's hurt. And so I unstrapped the gun belt, and I went up to the front, and I got on the penetrator and started to swing out. And as I started to swing out, all of a sudden he comes running back out of this bushes. He comes running up to where, where I'm going to be coming down on the ground at. And they grabbed me and pulled me back in, unsnapped me, and just sent the penetrator down, and we got him, and we brought him up. And that's with the DFC mission. We got him and we saved his, his life. Well, those are some great stories, Chief. Uh, we can open up to some questions right now. So if there's any questions in the audience for Chief Beasley. As long as they're clean. Hey, Chief. Thanks for coming today. Uh, my question is about what changes you've seen uh, in the pararescue community since you began through to today. What differences? Changes. Yeah, the differences and the changes. Oh. <laughs> uh, I ended up having two tours at the pararescue school, and so I was teaching uh, at, the, at the school. And the whole time, uh, both times that I was there, there was like a four-year absence between times. We'd we were an overage in the states, the pararescue was, so we would be in the states for a year and we'd end up going back overseas because uh, there was only about 200 of us. And uh, so you'd always end up, uh, and they had, we only had two units there in, in the states that they were, we had active duties at. So uh, during that four-year period, there wasn't any changes in it. I mean, we were going four years to four years to four years. It was all the same training. We, the same syllabus that we wrote for the, first, for the class that the first time I was there after we moved the school from Hill down to Albuquerque, uh, that syllabus was the same uh, four years later when I come back from England. And I sat there for another three years teaching it. Uh, there wasn't any difference. There was a, you know, we, we were teaching the same thing. And, and then when I retired out, uh, and I retired out of, of, uh, 
Alaska. I went from Alaska down to, to McClellan. But when I, uh, the last PJs that I'd worked with uh, on the team, uh, their, uh, the, the personalities and the, and the attitudes and the, the dedication that they have has always been the same. The training started changing and it started being, uh, uh, I, there just, there's just no way that I feel that the training they've got today is the same as what we had. They're so much uh, more, uh, they have medical equipment that we didn't even know. We had a, you know, we'd start an IV on the, on the, on the helicopter or we'd, uh, we'd do a venal cut down on the helicopter or on a 130. Uh, and we would, uh, that's because we had to bring them back. And we never landed. You didn't land a, a H3 or a 53 in Vietnam. You, everything was down the penetrator because you had the long, you had that, that canopy down there that you had to bring the stuff down. You couldn't bring it, I mean, you couldn't land any place because there was no clearing for, for landing. So, but t today's people, they're, they're uh, that medical equipment they've got on board, when you, I, and I, I watched that combat rescue, uh, and I said, uh, ooh, you know, I, I just, I, I can't understand the concept. And, and I, now I've been out 30 years, and I, I'm close contact with all the old PJs. We have a reunion every two years, and we sit back and, and like my, uh, and we tell stories. And my, my um, aunt used to say, uh, Donnie, you have the best stories because you embroider them really well. And I said, what does that mean? She said, it's a yarn. And I, that, that's where I learned out what a yarn was. Uh, but uh, we, w we sit around and we talk these stories and we talk about what, what the young guys are doing today and, what it, and they're absolutely unbelievable. I mean, they've got this training uh, uh, that, that we, we spend as much time training uh, and, and doing our, our equipment than what we did anything else. They go out, they make a jump, they pop their parachutes off and they walk over, get in the truck and go back to the, to the section and start lifting weights. Uh, they go on a scuba jump. They got, uh, we used to have to come back, wash the boat down, wash the parachutes down. Uh, they've got crews that do that for them now. They got riggers that come and take care of all the parachutes. They got medical people that take care of all the medical kits. We knew where everything was in that medical kit because we had to pack it. We made it. That was our job was to take care of our equipment also. And they don't do that today. They've got their own, they've got support, which is absolutely great. But I, I, I think that they're going away from part of what the basic is of, of doing the job. Uh, and that's uh, maintaining your equipment and, and making sure that it's, uh, you know what it is. Uh, I, uh, we now have, uh, at all the time I was in, we had all the NCOICs and all the commandants of the pararescue school and everything were all chiefs. Uh, now we have crows, and that's combat rescue officers. And I think there's a problem with the rescue officers and the other one, and I, not from experience, because I wasn't there when we had those. Uh, but with the crows, I, I think there's a problem because I, as a, as a, if I'm a tech sergeant and I've got a captain or a major that's in charge of, uh, is the crow, uh, if he's wrong, I'm, it's gonna be hard for me to tell him we're not gonna do it that way, we're gonna do it this way. And I, I mean, the, the experience might be different because this guy might have been in for, the tech might have been in or the master might have been in for 15 years already and the, and the crow has just been there for about three or four years. You need the experience running back and forth. In the, in the day was when, when the chiefs were there, we'd all been there forever. You know, we started up from there and we lived our life and we lived pararescue and uh, we had no problems going in and telling somebody, I don't think that's gonna work. And 99% uh, and of the time, when the staff would ask us something, if we're gonna be able to do something, we'd say, I don't think that's gonna work. We could walk out and they would take our word for it. We never had a problem. And I don't know if that's the same today. I don't think that's gonna work today. Uh, and again, I said, that's, uh, that's from the perspective of somebody that wasn't ever uh, in that world, in that, in that world. Uh, some of the problem that I've got with the PT system, uh, and all of us believe this thing, uh, when you go, Pararescue is a very physical field. Uh, God, we were little golden bears. We, PT was part of our program. I mean, you had to be physically fit because you didn't know when you went on the ground how long you were gonna be there or what you had to do or how many people you were gonna pull out and how long you were gonna be there. So you, you were pretty physically fit. And we all had that selection school. And the selection school, the only t the people that ever get washed out of selection school down at Eglin Air Force Base are those people that do the, the swim test. And the swim test is they get them and they almost drown them. And they think, uh, have you seen the wizard? 
and the wizard is supposed to be something that you're almost ready to black out, and when you're just about ready to black out, they'll pull you up. If you come up on your own, you're out of the program. And we're going, where, why would you need that to do the job? You know, I, that, I mean, that's the old guys talking. Why do, we went through scuba school, we went through, I mean, we had the, the pool harassment, they pulled the mask off of you, they stuck your head under water and everything, but they didn't take you to an extent that you had to do that particular thing and see the wizard. And uh, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a little bit of a crawl in all of us old, uh, the old PJs. Next question. Sir, as a uh, A-10 pilot in Sandy One myself, I just wonder uh, what the team that you guys got to build together in Vietnam, kind of how that worked, how when new technologies or new people show up, how you guys would figure out how to work together and better your, uh, your trade and make sure you could get everybody out there. So just do you, looking for some info on kind of how you guys developed uh, tactics to get after the problem of rescuing people kind of on the fly. So yeah. as you got new technologies or new Yeah, new it's, it's the technology, it was most of it, but when, you, when, you, when a new one came in, you, you, it was OJT, most of it, 99% of it is OJT and taking the kid aside and you've, and you've got a teammate, you've always teamed them up with, the other, with, the, with an older man, to, like everything is, you know. You want to teach the young kids what the old guys have. Uh, but the technology's got you up there before we even get to them. Uh, I don't know if there's any, any you know, golden rule how you would swing that around except through leadership, you know, that you, uh, that you get their attention and that, you, uh, that you're gonna, they believe in what you're doing and, and want to do it. I've always maintained you could take a guy off the curb out here that's just sitting there and he's not doing anything and say, you want to be a PJ. And if he said he wanted to be a PJ, you could take him and make him a PJ. I mean, if you trained him and you did, uh, uh, just one guy could take the other guy and do that to him. Because I think that anybody that's, uh, if you go out and you, and you see somebody do something spectacular, uh, now there's some things that are not going to happen, but normally if, you, if it's a human being doing something and you're in that boat, if you get the training they've got, you can do the same damn thing they got. And uh, I think that's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see any difference in, in uh, where we get the new recruits and the old recruits, if there was any difference in, in how we selected them and put them into the program. That big selection program at, at Eglin is, uh, not Eglin, at uh, Lackland, uh, that's, that's huge. And they, they go through a whole lot of training there. And they, when, they go to, when they go to Kirtland Air Force Base now, again, they're the students. And as students, you need to know what's in your medical kit. And you also need to know what's in the scuba tank. And can you fill this up to so high or so much pressure and, and use a Cornelius compressor? Or you need to know what that parachute is and how to pack it and how to do it. They don't do that. They've got the support teams there to do that. They just go and do the medical part, basically. They, uh, they're the best medics walking down the pike right now. Uh, everybody wants them. They, the Marines want them, the Navy wants them. Uh, all the little teams that go out and, and uh, uh, we've got, uh, well, two, I guess, two cr uh, cross winners already this year, or this, uh, out of this war. Uh, and that's uh, the, the medical part. They were with the Rangers and, and they're embedded in these other teams. And they've got to, you know, they got to transition pretty fast if they're going to work with other, other uh, services. Well, Chief, uh, if you would like to give a piece of advice from leadership perspective, especially with your 31 year career, um, from a Chief's perspective, for the majors of ACSC, what piece of advice would you give them as far as leadership is concerned? Yeah, I believe, lead by example. You know, I mean, I, I would never do anything that I wouldn't ask anybody else to do. Uh, if, if you had to have something or you're gonna have to do a job, then you need to have, you need to be able to do that job too. You just don't go out there and tell them. I don't think any good decisions have ever been made sitting in a, in a, in a swivel chair, and I don't know who made that statement, but I believe that. I believe that you got to be on your feet and you got to be out there talking with people and doing the job and uh, letting them know that you know what they're doing. To be, just to be able to say, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that you've got, uh, I've always maintained that I'll surround myself with the best people. If I ever got any, any kind of praise or anything else, it wasn't me that got it, 
it's because these guys backed me up. These guys were the boys that uh, took care of the program. And if you don't take care of your people and you don't lead by example, well, then I think you're a failure. Uh, because you've got you've to have those, uh, those guys believing in you and uh, to follow you. And I think that's uh, one of the big things is just have them believe in you and, and lead by example. Chief, thank you for being with us today and sharing for your, your experiences and your uh, insight and leadership. Thank you. Thank you.